This recording is going to be mostly about web stuff, uh, HTML, domain name registration, if you wanted to purchase your own domain for your website and your own web hosting and how to do that. Um, if you don't want to purchase your own domain name, then I would suggest GitHub pages. All right. So in the PowerPoint here, domain name registration, the company of choice that I like is Namecheap. And you can go to namecheap.com right now and see if the domain you want is available. Um, obviously, I already have a domain and I, I use Namecheap and they're great and they're affordable. And um, if we go to Namecheap, you can type the domain idea that you're maybe thinking of right here and uh, you know see if it's available. So if I try to do google.ca and I search for this, obviously that's taken and uh, it's going to say it's unavailable. You can make an offer, but it was registered in 2000. All right. And it has their employees and everything. So if you were thinking of maybe doing, uh, I don't know, that Canadian guy dot CA or something, you can get it for 14 bucks a year, um, which is sweet. And that's in Canadian. So you can hit add to cart here. Uh, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint because I don't actually want to buy one, but you can hit add to cart. So in this example, I did my first and la first letter, my first name and my last name .ca, and you just hit add to cart. And then for add-ons, you can select whichever ones of these, um, oops, that you think are necessary. So um, obviously you need web hosting no matter what, and that's $10 a month is what it shows here. Uh, I believe you can actually get it a lot cheaper than that and it should be around $35 a year. I just did I just purchased one recently and it was only about $40 US for one year of hosting and domain name registration. And then if you want an SSL certificate, you can uh, add that as well for $6 a year, but I just want to make you aware that you can get an SSL certificate for free when you add WordPress to your site and then install it to an HTTPS directory. So you don't have to pay for an SSL certificate. There's also something called um, Let's Encrypt, which offers, um, if you do Let's Encrypt for Namecheap, you can get free SSL in just a few clicks by installing it here. And there's a ton of tutorials for installing your own SSL certificate. SSL certificate is basically this lock up here in the top left. And when I click it, it shows that the certificate is valid and we can see um, it's valid from 2020, December 2nd to 2021, December 3rd. Um, so that's what an SSL certificate is. If you don't have an SSL certificate and you go to um, say, I think what will happen Let me see. No, that didn't work. Usually it will redirect to your secure site, but if you don't, you'll sometimes get that error message that basically says, Hey, uh, Google doesn't think this site is secure. Um, don't proceed, take caution, whatever. And then it just shows this really big error sign, which scares users away from your website. So SSL is a good thing to have here. Other than that, you don't need WordPress hosting because you can install WordPress for free. You won't need a VPN and you don't need a professional email because you can get those all for free. And I'll show you how if you get Namecheap. All right, so you choose checkout. And here we can see, uh, if I zoom in, I chose two years because you actually get a like a 6% off deal um, when you go through and purchase your domain. And then the Stellar business. So you've got two things here. Um, I'll just annotate two things going on. So you've got your domain, right? And that is basically the name that you're paying for. So I'm paying for bvanaragon.ca. Google pays for google.ca. The name itself is not a website. It's just something that shows up in the browser that redirects to the actual server or IP address where your files are hosted. The actual hosting is here, and that's what you're paying for to keep your server online all the time. So for two years, it was $126 in this example, um, which is about, you know, 60 bucks a year, which is relatively cheap. If you go to one of those sites like Wix or GoDaddy or um, whatnot, I've looked before and 
it's pretty expensive. It's like 250 bucks, 300 bucks for a website. If you can find it cheaper than that and it's, you know, similar to this, then by all means go for it because they do everything for you. But uh, those websites I think are more so meant for people that aren't as developer inclined and don't really want to get their hands dirty with code or um, FTP file transfer protocol stuff. So this is going to be a cheaper option for you when you're buying your own server. All right. So you hit apply and we did two years for all of these and I set auto renew on, but it will still send an email letting you know that it's going to charge your credit card. Now, when you're checking out, you obviously create an account, you come up with a password, a first and last name, and then you make an email address that you want them to sign you up for. They'll actually send a complete breakdown of your uh, IP address for your server, the name, the password for the database and everything to your email. So if you ever lose it and you don't write it down or whatever, you can always find it in the email that they send you. Add your billing information. So if you wanna pay PayPal or Visa, um, so then in this case, you'd pay the 120 bucks and then you'd have a website set for two years. And here we have, uh, you know, the server host name and then the IP address to the server. And then this is what I was talking about here, the cPanel details. So cPanel is what actually allows you to manage your website and make changes to, uh, the server settings. So if you want to enable SSH for the shell, if you want to, you know, add an email or something like that, then you can do that. And they give you a login and a password to get into your cPanel. So I'll show you what cPanel is right now. And I'll show you some of the things you can do with cPanel. So I'll go to my website slash cPanel, and it's just connecting here. And then I've got to log in. <laughs> uh, I actually have a better way because I don't remember my login right now. So I'll actually just go to Namecheap and go to my dashboard. And on my dashboard here, once I've logged in, it'll show me all the websites I own. Um, so here, if I expand this, we can see I'm paying for hosting. I'm paying for this domain name. It's set to renew on May 7th, 2022. And my SSL certificate is active and I got that for free. So if I actually click this little icon here, that's your server, and you can hit go to cPanel here. So I click that, and it will just redirect me to the cPanel on my actual server. Okay, so what this does, all of these settings are available to you. So why I, I mentioned not to buy an email account. So in here, if I click this under the email accounts, this is one of the settings that cPanel allows you to do. You can literally just hit this create button and you can create a user at the domain name that you're paying for. So if you want one of those fancy professional emails uh, or whatever, uh, you know, your first name at your last name. So I've got Benjamin at Veneragon.ca. You can do that if you own the domain name with your last name on it. If you want it to be a company that you create in the future and you want to have your first name at you know georgiancollege.ca you can create an email just as simple as i just hit create and then i just hit the username right here and i could have asdf at veneragon.ca excuse me obviously i'll cancel that because i don't want that user to be created and each user gets 32 gigabytes of email storage now this has come in really handy for me because uh, the bank actually looks at this as a professional email. Um, and if you ever want to do email confirmation versus, you know, cell phone uh, verification, you can add your email to your bank and get your confirmations through that. So because I change cell phone numbers all the time, uh, it's really helpful for me to have an email that never changes that I can do my second verification through. Um, so there you go. That is an easy way to add an email for free with Namecheap. Uh, let's go back to the dashboard. So you can set up all of this sort of stuff within email settings for routing, spam filters, etc. cetera. Um, if you want to have, you know, databases on your website, you can have MySQL, PHP, my admin. I don't have any of that, but you can get really complicated into it. Um, you know, you can add subdomains, which would be like, if I wanted to add uh, ben.vinaragon.ca or uh, music.ben and I wanted to put all my music on my 
website or something like that, you can add um, metrics if you want to measure your visitors, your bandwidth, um, all of that good stuff. SSH access allows you to actually port in to your server and type into the shell um, some commands. So that's really powerful and you got to be careful with that. You can uh, add WordPress really easily for free. So like I mentioned, if you want to add WordPress, you just click this thing called Soft Delicious Apps Installer down in the software section, open it up in a new tab, and then you can add any of these to your website. And it's really, really easy. So if you want to add WordPress, you can just hit the install button here. Now I'm not going to, because I don't want to overwrite what I have, but basically you can just go uh, click all of the defaults and then um, you can see I actually installed it here, um, right there, and it, you can manage it and uh, you can just leave all the defaults or you can change your username and passwords for your WordPress account. Um, and then it just installs it automatically. The key when you're installing WordPress onto your website um, is here. When I click install now, if you want to get an SSL certificate for free, you have to choose HTTPS from this dropdown. And then obviously your domain name. And then you can leave the WP directory blank and then choose the latest version of WordPress. What this will do is it will install WordPress at the HTTPS directory. And obviously if it's an HTTPS uh, domain, like it is up here, it'll have a lock. So WordPress will actually install an SSL certificate for you for free. And it's good for about a year or two, um, which is really cool. And then you can just click the, click the quick install. Um, you can change your password or admin, uh, you know, email accounts. If you don't want to have the limit login temps, you can check that off. Um, and then any of these advanced options, you know, if you want to change what the prefix is on your WordPress database, um, or if you don't want to allow backups for your WordPress database, um, obviously then you can change all of those, but you can just leave the defaults. Just make sure you do HTTPS where you install it and then you can click quick install. Um, I won't do that now because I already, uh, like my website the way it is and it will overwrite it. So you have to be careful with that. Okay. So that's cPanel. Obviously there's a lot of other settings here that I rarely, rarely use. Um, but, uh, this lets you manage your website from the back end kind of thing and, uh, you know, add email add SSL and add WordPress. So WordPress is really awesome because uh, like you might've seen there, uh, if I go to my site and log in to my WordPress admin, if you go to your themes, obviously WordPress is kind of the go-to now and a lot of people create these default themes. So you can uh, get a live preview if you like some of these themes and you can browse through a store or a theme store, a theme library of all these preset themes that people have created. And uh, this one is not really loading properly. Um, oh, I know why. Just cause I've got some funky code. Um, but you can see here what the themes look like. I don't want to activate them because I have a theme that I already have customized to myself, but here you can see this option, you know, they've got, um, some text and some images with a nice landing page, and you could just replace that with, you know, your mobile image, uh, for your mobile page for now until you customize stuff further. But like I was saying, um, for the project, I really want you guys to make it your own. So change the theme colors, change the fonts, change the positioning of stuff, move things around, add blocks, add elements. Um, don't just rely solely on someone creating a theme for you because that's really uh, not programming or learning anything for yourself. So um, I'm fine if you use a theme, I just want you to actually make it your own, which involves a lot of work still. So it's not like an easy out just by activating a theme. Okay, so um, that's WordPress. Uh, and I'll show you more on WordPress in the future. But for now, that's how you buy and purchase domain names and hosting. You'll get an email if you have a .ca. 
you'll get an email from the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, um, and they manage all the .ca country code domains. Um, basically, you just have to comply with some certain um, documentation that they put out, but it's nothing crazy. Um, all right, if you want to upload files directly to your server, so say you don't want to do WordPress, you can use FileZilla. Okay, and then there's a way to add your site through File Site Manager, and then actually add that um, server IP address so that you can just, you know, if you have an index.html and you want to upload some raw files like your CSS and your bootstrap, excuse me, then you can just put these settings in. So the server that your account's hosted on, they email that to you in this image. That's the server right there. So you put that server from whatever email they send it to you in the host. Okay. So in this host box where it says host, and then there's the port and the protocol. So the port is 21098. The protocol is SFTP. The logon type is normal. Um, your username for your cPanel and then your cPanel password. So it'll look like this, right? So I've got my username, my password, the logon type is normal. My port's 21098. Um, your server, your SFTP. If you want to do it through F F FTPES, then it's a different port. Um, this one is not secure. So you have file transfer protocol that's secure, and then you have not secure. This one is just port 21. It is, uh, oh, sorry, this one requires explicit FTP over TLS. So it's a different way of encrypting. It still does have encryption, but it's just slightly different. Um, same thing though, username, password, Once the basic uh, settings are configured, you can transfer the settings and save them uh, as a default connection. Um, and then there's a couple other settings that we have to change. So you want uh, in this transfer settings tab, so we put all that stuff in general. We go to the transfer settings tab, we wanna set passive. We wanna check limit number of simultaneous connections to one, okay? I'm gonna open up my FileZilla right now just to show you guys what this looks like. Have you guys ever used FileZilla before? No, yes, okay, some of you, okay. So FileZilla is basically a way, uh, everything on the left-hand side, if I draw this out, everything over here is locally stored on my machine. Everything over here is on my server. As you can see here, I'm not connected to a server. And then basically it's just Windows Explorer. So you just have like your file names, the last time it was modified, the file size, whatever. So as you can see here, I'm just on my desktop um, and I can go into, well, I don't have to go anywhere. I'm just on my desktop and I've got some documents there. Now this, you can quick connect to a server here. Uh, I have some servers saved there, or I can go to my, Network Configuration Site Manager. All right, cool. So we can see here, I have my sites and it's veneragon.ca. And obviously I've got my settings in there for my server, my port, my username and my password. And then I've set the transfer settings to check limit number of simultaneous connections and maximum number of connections one. This is just so that I can only connect once and I don't overwrite my connection or anything like that. And then I can just hit the connect button here. Or what I can do is I can do server reconnect. Okay, so then what that does is you can see it says a couple things up here, connecting to the server, using the username, using the password, and then it just connects. And then we can see public underscore dot HTML is your main folder when you've got a website under WordPress. Okay, and then all of your WordPress uh, documents are stored in folders that are prefixed with the letters WP hyphen. So all my WordPress admin content and includes files are in there. Same with all of this stuff. If I have cron jobs or logins or email settings, whatever. If you don't have WordPress installed, then you'll just see your site and then there'll just be some, uh, it will probably just be empty actually. You might have a www or a veneragon.ca, like whatever your domain name is. And uh, you can upload 
files directly to your web server. So for example, let me just load up my website here. Okay, so I'm on veneragon.ca. Now I created this using uh, a theme called Divi, but that doesn't, that's not what I'm gonna talk about right now. So under my public HTML, which is kind of my root folder, sometimes this will be called root, sometimes it's just your domain name, um, all of my content for my site exists here. So if I wanted to, I can create a directory and I can call this uh, week six because we're in week six of Mobile App Portfolio One. All right, and it creates it right there. And right now it's just gonna be an empty directory, but it still exists. So if I go veneragon.ca slash week six, now that I just created it, we can see we're on index of week six and I can go parent directory and then it will take me back. Now, as an example um, of how this works, let me quickly grab a basic website design. Okay. So what I'll do is I will browse up here on my local machine. Remember everything on my left-hand side is my local machine over here. Okay. So I just browsed to uh, my web applications course in my week two folder, and I've got a file called, um, which folder do I wanna go into? Week two. If I click week two, I can see all of the files down here inside of that folder, and I've got a file called grid.html. Now, if I go inside of my week six folder here that I just created on my server side, we can see it's empty, right? And that's why when we visit it, it says just index of. Now if I go back to my FileZilla and I just double click this or right click and upload, double clicking it will upload it as well. We can see it just appears right here. Um, so you can see very quickly down at the bottom, it queued the file and then now under successful transfers, there's a one. If I click successful transfers, we can see that the file actually, if I expand this grid.html actually successfully, was uploaded. Okay, so then if I go back to this page and I refresh it, because this is on a server, it should load uh, grid.html. So now I can see grid.html there. Or what I can do is because I know it's called grid.html, I can type that in my URL, hit enter, and it should load uh, grid.html. No. Let me try this. Oh, it's seven dot grid. That's <laughs> called seven dot grid dot HTML. And now here, this is what I was expecting. It's just a very basic uh, website that I used that I made using the bootstrap grid, right? And that is now hosted online. You guys could go visit this right now. If I put this link in chat, um, which I will, and you can go and see that that's actually there hosted live. So that's how FileZilla works really rough. Um, so any code that you actually design in HTML, CSS, you can just double click, upload, and then it's there in your server. If you ever need to update it, you can download it from here, edit it on your local machine, and then re-upload it. Um, you can also just edit it on your local machine and then overwrite what you have on your server, but sometimes you have to be careful what you overwrite. Cool, uh, back to the PowerPoint. So that's how you use FileZilla to transfer. Um, obviously they're talking about the public HTML file moving all of this stuff. So if you have audio images, scripts and stuff, and then uploading it, you can drag and drop too. And then now it's on the server side. So kind of a, just an example of what I just talked about there. Um, and that's using FileZilla with Namecheap. Um, very good. So it is getting a little bit, uh, or not late, but I don't want to go too long um, in class today. So, there's a lot of other things that I wanted to cover, but I might have to cover these next week because um, I want to give you guys a little bit of time to work asynchronously. <clears throat> How comfortable are you guys with HTML?
show of thumbs for people who are pretty comfortable with HTML. A little bit. Okay. Thumbs down, not too comfortable. Thumbs up, comfortable. Got a mix. Okay, no worries. So I'm just gonna do a couple more PowerPoints or maybe just one more PowerPoint because I don't wanna go too late. I know it's Friday and you guys just wanna enjoy the weekend. A recap of what HTML is. And you guys can go through these again um, in your own time, but uh, we start every HTML document with this line of code, doc type HTML. And what this does is it tells the browser that we're gonna use hypertext markup language so that the browser interprets the page and interprets the code and renders it properly in the browser. Cool, no worries guys, we'll, we'll go over it. Um, the next thing that happens is inside of that tag is we have the HTML tag. Everything in HTML is generally lowercase and most tags will have an opening and an ending tag. So here's our opening tag and here's our ending tag. This tag, the HTML tag, is called the root node. So everything on our page is inside of this. So that grid.html page, I can open this with um, Visual Studio Code just to show you guys. Just load it up here. Microsoft, okay, we'll just use Sublime. So don't worry about all the other gibberish that's going on, but here's the doctype.html right up here. And then here's my root node. And you can add this little setting lang equals English if you want. Um, it's not necessary, but it just sets the language for the browser. And then we can see if I scroll all the way to the bottom and just ignore all that code, there's our closing HTML tag. Okay. So that's the root node. Everything is inside of that. All of this stuff makes up that page that I showed you um, right here, all of that stuff. Okay. So that's our root node. And between these two, there's two structures, two main structures that are nested in between the root node. The first one is our head tag. And the second one is our body tag. So if I were to just quickly annotate this for you guys, you have um, the root node, right? Which contains everything. And then you have say a head tag here. And this contains all the metadata. Metadata is basically data about data. <laughs> Sounds stupid, but it's kind of like the beginning of a book. So if you think about the table of contents or the data about who the author is or um, you know where the book was published, all of that stuff. So this kind, kind of contains references to your CSS and your style sheet or your JavaScript. This contains references to like what icons you want to use on the page and what the title of the page is. All of that stuff is in the head tag. So we can see it here. There's the opening head tag and the closing head tag. Um, and then everything else is in the body tag. All right. And I'll talk about the body tag in the next slide. But uh, there's a couple specific things like metadata that we include in the head tag. The first one is the character set or the char set. So we use the meta tag and then uh, we set the char set to UTF-8, which stands for Unicode 8-bit. And that just basically includes most of the characters and most of the letter glyphs from every language around the world so that most languages and most characters will be referenced or sorry, rendered correctly in the browser. So the meta tag is different. You'll notice it has no opening and closing tag. It only has a slash here, and then it has the closing node at the end. So it's all in one. There's a couple key tags in HTML that are all in one, but most of the time you'll have the opening head tag and the closing head tag, or an opening meta and a closing meta. Cool. So the next tag is uh, also a tag that goes inside of the, meta the metadata, and it's the title tag. The title tag is simply um, what gets rendered in the browser tab. So here you can see I have not set a title tag because it's just HTTPS colon slash slash veneerground.ca. Whereas when you're on um, Namecheap, you can see here that it just says Namecheap. Or here it says install free SSLs. 
So whatever you actually put in there, that will show up in the tab title. Okay, so that's what the that's what the title tag does here. So here the title would say the toaster in the top of the page. All right. The next tag is the body tag, and the body tag contains everything inside of the rest of the page. And there's a couple uh, other main tags that I'm showing you on this uh, page here. So we've got the P tag, which is the paragraph, and we've got our opening and our closing P tag. So it's just simply like this, P, and then whatever text you want to write in there, you know, you can write whatever. And then you have your closing P, which you just put a slash. Um, and then the other one is an H1. And we can have H1 all the way up to H6. Uh, so you can do H2 uh, all the way up to H6. The biggest size is H1, and it, stand, it stands for heading. Um, and so it'll just basically render it, render it in a bigger font. And H6 is almost the same size as P, just slightly bigger, okay? Um, so that's what a heading tag is, H1 and P. So you can make very simple titles and paragraphs with H1 and P tags. So here's an example of uh, a very simple website. It's got a body tag. Inside, there's an H1 that says the toaster. There's an IMG tag with a source, and that SRC is referencing an image. The image is locally placed in the same folder as where index.html is in an images folder called silver-toaster.jpg. So that's how we reference an image. And then it's just a paragraph that says the greatest thing since sliced bread. So that would just be a very simple website that would show a title, an image, and then a paragraph about it, all right? Um, so here, talking about the IMG tag, uh, we can give the source or the reference to the file. So you just have to reference where it is in location from the index.html. So if it's in a subfolder called food, and then there's another folder inside of the folder called food called burgers, you'd have to go slash food, slash burgers, slash whatever your image title is, dot JPEG or PNG or whatever the file type, right? The other tag here is um, sort of optional, but sort of not. It's the alt um, selector. And this is just uh, for accessibility reasons. This is so people who are visually impaired or have slow internet and can't load the image fast enough, this text will appear in place of the image. Or a screen reader will read this text to a visually impaired person. So it's important to include alt text or alternate text with every image tag that you create. So that's the really basics about HTML. Um, I'll probably stop the recording here because I don't want to get too carried away and we'll continue getting into HTML stuff next week. And next semester, you'll have a class with me where we get into mobile web applications too, where I can get really, really involved um, and we can really perfect our websites. But I'll stop that recording.